Hi everyone, this is Paul Fisher from the University of Florida IFAS Extension. It's a real pleasure to introduce today Dr. Chris Marble, who's an assistant professor at the Mid-Florida Research and Education Center. Chris is one of the instructors for our weed management course in Greenhouse Training Online, and that course is focused on really good quality science-based technical information for greenhouse and nursery growers. So Chris is one of the most talented young professors in our department and it's a real pleasure to introduce you today. So welcome, Chris. Thank you, Paul. So today what I'm gonna to be talking to you about is reducing nursery weed control costs. And some of these five uh, tips that I'm going to go over, they might seem counterintuitive, like they could possibly increase costs because of increased possibly labor, uh, time or materials, but these costs would be upfront. And so in the end, we've seen all of these strategies work to reduce nursery weed control costs over time uh, and really provide a lot of benefits and increased profits in real world situations. So the first uh, way, the first tip is going to be probably the most important and that is sanitation. And the mantra for weed management and nursery weed control is going to be start clean and stay clean. That's very critical. And so a couple of places where weeds, get, get, weeds start to become issues First is in greenhouses, so under greenhouse benches and floors. Uh, and in these areas, people might not pay as close attention to them if they're growing on the floors because they're away from the crops. But eventually those um, weeds that are growing under those floors and in those non-production spaces are eventually going to get up onto the tables and grow into the crops and start to cause issues. One of those places where they cause a lot of issues is in propagation, especially unrooted cuttings. So when we get weeds in unrooted cuttings during propagation, we have no chemical controls that can really be used. And so it's very important for um, propagation areas to keep those as weed free uh, as possible and as clean as possible. Another place where weeds start to become issues throughout the production space is in liners and then nursery stock. So whether you're buying your liners in or you're producing your own liners, during the potting process, make sure that those liners are as weed free as possible. Even just a few weeds that are skipped uh, during the potting process, those weeds are going to continue to grow and spread throughout the nursery, oftentimes exponentially. Um, another thing to keep in mind too, when you're potting up plants and um, liners, is that uh, those weeds that are there, even if they're very small, pre-emergence herbicides aren't going to be effective. So you start uh, behind the game if you let those weeds grow there. Um, bark piles, uh, where you keep your substrates in your pine bark or your, your fir bark, wherever you keep those, those bark, um, those, sub, those growing substrates, those potting soils, those areas have to be weed free also. One of the biggest issues that I see is when people have uh, pine bark stored in different areas and those areas are not kept weed free. So those should be uh, stored on concrete slabs if, if at all possible and used as quickly as possible because weed seeds are gonna eventually blow in and they get onto that pine bark and then you start out with uh, a lot of issues. Pots, trays, and um, even reusing su recycled substrate are also things that I see that cause a lot of problems. And again, um, when, we're, when we have um, uh, nursery pots that are, uh, uh, have weed seeds, a lot of weed seeds can stay and get stuck on those nursery pots. Uh, and those will often grow around the edges of containers and a lot of times our herbicides aren't going to be that effective on those. So um, using clean pots and things like that are going to be important. And then just keeping those non-crop areas in those production spaces as weed free as possible. Another thing that I want to talk about is hand weeding more frequently. So uh, this whole presentation is mostly going to be talking about reducing weed control costs and trying to reduce hand weeding, but weeding more frequently is going to reduce the total amount of time and labor that you spend weeding. I was, I was fortunate enough to be able to take part in a research project where we looked at hand weeding intervals. So essentially we had block, different blocks of plants at different nurseries. And um, the only difference in the blocks of plants were that some were weeded every two weeks and some were weeded every eight weeks. Both blocks were treated with the same herbicide. Over time, what we saw was, was that weeding every two weeks reduced our hand weeding time and our total labor costs by about uh, 50 to 70%, depending upon uh, the nursery and the location. And so how did this happen? Essentially, when you're weeding every two weeks, 
those weeds are never able to go to seed and your weed pressure actually decreases uh, over time. Uh, if you wait and do it at just an eight week interval, possibly before applying a pre-emergent herbicide again, the, all of these weed species that we battle with in nurseries are able to go to seed. And so the, the pressure just increases uh, throughout the entire year. Now doing this process is gonna require people to just um, hand weed a little bit more differently. So when you're doing this and you're weeding every two weeks, you don't actually have to pull up all weeds. Essentially what you wanna do is any weed that is about uh, the size of a quarter or less, you would want to uh, leave those because you're gonna get it in two weeks and that weed is not gonna have a chance to go to seed. Uh, but if they're larger than that, you wanna go ahead and weed those because those do have a chance to go to seed before you come back in the next following two weeks. Another tip is going to be using non-chemical methods where they could be needed and used. So most growers are gonna use pre-emergent herbicides, but in some cases you might have crops or different areas where pre-emergent herbicides can't be utilized. So some things that can be used that are very effective in these areas are mulches, things like rice holes, pine bark nuggets, uh, even weed discs and wood chips uh, have all been shown to reduce hay weeding costs by anywhere between 30 uh, to 50% depending upon the situation. Now, all these materials are gonna cost much more than herbicides on a per pot basis, but they cost much less than hand weeding um, over time. A couple of things that we've been looking at in research here at the University of Florida is using stratified substrates to uh, manage weeds. So essentially what this process is, is we're using pine bark with different particle sizes and different physical properties in different portions of the container. And this is the method that was developed by some other researchers. Uh, and essentially we're looking at it from a weed management perspective. And essentially what we're doing here is we're looking at large particle pine bark on the top surface of the substrate. And then we have our, our finer texture material on the bottom part of the pot. Uh, and that's gonna hold ample water uh, for, the, for the ornamentals to grow. And what we've seen is, is with bittercress, liverwort, and several other key weed species, we can reduce growth by about 50% by using uh, these stratified substrates. Subdressing is another method that we've seen to be very effective. So essentially applying fertilizer in a single layer um, beneath the sub surface of the, of the substrate. And with this, we've seen uh, weed reductions up to 80% with things like spurge, eucalypta, and crabgrass. The next thing I wanna talk about is developing a pre-emergence herbicide program. A lot of people will often just pick herbicides or maybe pick one or two herbicides that they like and are safe for their crops, and they'll stick with those over time. And that can work, but you're not getting the best results that you really could. Here on this slide, I have all of the different pre-emergent herbicides that are labeled for use in container nurseries over the top of nursery crops. And they're color-coded by mode of action. And so when you look at a chart like this, what you wanna ask yourself is, am I using herbicides with different modes of action? Um, because if you're using some herbicides with similar modes of action or the same mode of action, uh, essentially you're gonna just be controlling a certain uh, number of weeds and there's gonna be weed species that are gonna escape and then those are continue to thrive. So when you're thinking of developing a program, what you essentially wanna do is determine all the options that you have that are labeled for your particular crops, uh, figure out your key weed species at different months of the year, and then the months when you can go out and apply those pre-emergent herbicides, when you can go out and select uh, the different herbicides at the different times of the year to pick up those species that those herbicides are most strong on. While we're talking about herbicides, another tip for you to consider is utilizing more liquid or spray applied pre-emergent herbicides. So some growers are, are weary of, of uh, utilizing a lot of liquid or spray applied herbicides because they can increase phytotoxicity in some cases. But from a chemical cost perspective, liquid herbicides can be, are gonna decrease your chemical cost by 30 to 50% um, uh, just in chemical costs for the same amount of active ingredient as with a comparable granular uh, herbicide. Another thing to consider is that if you had a boom or you had larger equipment and you were able to apply these, it's much more efficient uh, in terms of labor because one person can treat acres and acres in a single day, whereas it might take five or six people to cover the same ground uh, using standard belly grinder type spreaders with um, granular herbicides. Uh, we've also seen increased control at nurseries uh, when they have switched to spray applied herbicides, as you can see 
uh, in this chart here. For sevolatic and greens, we consistently see better results with spray applied herbicides when they're applied in nursery situations. And that's typically just because um, a lot of growers depend upon their equipment and their setup. They can apply liquid herbicides a lot more accurately than they can granules. And that's gonna be the most important aspect of any herbicide or pesticide application, and that is getting the correct rate out. So to summarize the five tips that we talked about, first, focus on sanitation. This is probably the most important tip for reducing weed control costs. Hand weed more frequently to hand weed less overall. Use non-chemical methods when they're needed so that those crops that you can't use pre-market herbicides on don't become inoculum to spread weeds throughout the uh, entire production space. You want to focus on developing pre-emergence herbicides programs, not just picking herbicides um, uh, uh, to apply. Uh, you want to choose herbicides strategically and time them strategically. And then also while you're selecting herbicides, possibly consider incorporating some liquid-based pre-emergence herbicides, which can reduce chemical costs. They're often easier to apply uh, and they will save time in terms of uh, application. Uh, as a bonus tip, uh, be sure to follow up with uh, the research that I'm doing and the other university um, uh, research that is out there. We provide a lot of resources and training. One training that I offer is um, uh, Weed Management for Nurseries and Greenhouses, which is an online course uh, that will be uh, available and um, registration is available at the link that's provided on this slide here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. That was great. And what I like about your solutions here is that they also are compatible with the rest of nursery operations. I, I look at, for example, the mulching that you're doing. We use mulches of rice hulls also for fungus gnat management as well in containers, another benefit. You know, I had a recent question from a grower about liverwort control specifically and, and how would liverwort apply to some of these tips? So liverwort is, is a particular uh, weed that is very sensitive to cultural conditions. It likes high nitrogen environments, high um, uh, moisture environments. Uh, so it is one that spreads, it's very problematic in greenhouses uh, and then in other protected areas. And oftentimes in those areas, we can't use pre-emergence herbicides. Um, another uh, problem with liverwort is the fact that it spreads by spores. And so a lot of our pre-emergence herbicides aren't even effective for it. So things like rice holes are excellent for liverwort because rice holes drain uh, very quickly. With the stratified substrates uh, method that um, I talked about and uh, with the, um, the subdressing uh, method that I talked about, essentially with those two, those combinations of those two non-chemical uh, methods were taking away the way that liverwort likes to spread. And um, I showed on the slide there with bittercress uh, that we saw uh, up to 80% control but with liverwort, we've seen even better uh, control. So uh, essentially when we stratify substrates and then when we subdress fertilizer, uh, we're getting about 5% of the pot that might be covered with liverwort. Uh, whereas with um, a standard um, pine bark substrate with incorporator top dress fertilizer, we're at 100% liverwort coverage. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I'm excited about this stratified substrate approach that you're working on here. So thank you very much. And uh, again, I just put in a plug for Chris's online course. And thanks again, Chris. Thank you.